Greetings today from Botswana. I'm reading today from, from uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. This is the story of Naaman the Syrian, which many of you will be familiar with. But I was just marveling recently as I was, as I was going over it. I, I shouldn't even say that. For some reason, the Lord brought it to my mind and he just showed me the tremendous humbling that Naaman the Syrian went through uh, before he was healed. It's something that I think kind of gets lost in the story. It is a wonderful story. Uh, and it's uh, Jesus even referred to it in Luke chapter 4. But we're going to look at this a little bit. Now we know Naaman. Naaman was the captain of the host for the king of Syria. He was a very important man. Uh, the scripture describes him as a mighty man of valor. He was an honorable man. He had won a great deliverance, or actually says that the Lord had given Syria a great deliverance through him. Praise God for giving him the glory. And this is his description, but he was a leper. And so that would be something that is very hard to live with. And yet, obviously, he had established a name for himself uh, well beyond this disease. Of course, Israel had, had rules and regulations for those with leprosy. But uh, this wouldn't have applied to, to Naaman because he was a Syrian. One of the first things it says in a point of humbling here says that the Syrians had gone out by companies and they brought away captives out of the land of Israel and they brought to Naaman and his household a little maid and she waited on Naaman's wife. So we assume that this is probably a girl, uh, maybe 8 to 12 years old, but it says a little maid. We think that's probably what it means. It doesn't seem unreasonable. And the maid says to her mistress, would, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for then he would recover him of his leprosy. So the first thing that's rather humbling uh, for, for Naaman, of course, he would be uh, the leprosy itself would be somewhat humbling because he is a mighty man of valor, but he can't do anything about his leprosy. I do think he was probably accustomed to it by that time. It certainly didn't slow him down uh, from earning a reputation. But it would have been somewhat humbling. But now, the person that is pointing the way to his his cure, his answer uh, for what he needs, is a is a little girl. So it's not only a child, but it's also a female. And that's not not me saying it. I'm just saying that for a great man warrior of that time, that may have been considered humbling. And so after that, he says, "Okay." This is what we're going to do. We're going there. The, the king of Syria wrote him a letter of recommendation to the king of Israel so that he would go. And so he met with the king of Israel. This was really uh, kind of amazing. Of course, going down, he had his servants with him. He had a great reward with him also. We see this from verse 5. He had a great reward uh, for the prophet. But when he came to the king... And this is, this is not something to really go on with uh, for our theme of humbling. But, you know, the king was all bent out of shape because Naaman was coming and asking him to recover him from his leprosy. And he said, how can I do that? But Elisha was there in his own city. But this little girl, this little girl who had been carried away, she knew. Uh, you might also remember, if you know anything scripturally, that Elisha and uh, the king of Israel at this time, were typically at odds. This was not a, a good God-fearing king. And somehow it blinded him to the fact that there was a well-qualified prophet to address this need. So anyway, when, when Naaman came to the king of Israel and he told him what was going on, the king rent his clothes. He tore them and this, got, this news got back to Elisha. They're living in the same city, different sections of the same city, Samaria. And Elisha says, send him down. That he will know there is a there is a real prophet here in Israel, and uh, he was not even exalting himself by that. He was really exalting God because there are many prophets, but there but there were few real prophets, and we can see that also by Scripture. And so we look at this, and he went down to Elisha. Now, we know that, of course, word got back to Elisha of why the king rent his clothes, all the things going on. And Naaman was an important man. He was an important man. He was on, in an, on an important journey. It was important for him. And really, I mean, Israel and Syria were typically, you know, competitors at odds, sometimes at war. 
And so even that would have been humbling, you know, to come and ask the, the king of Israel for this. But, you know, they did, they were at peace. And there were times we read when there were prophets of Israel went into Syria, they were appointing kings and whatnot. And so there was a little interaction going on there. But the thing is that when Naaman came to Elisha, Elisha didn't even come out to meet him. Talk about humbling. I mean, you are a great, important man. You are the, the captain of the host for the army of your country. And this prophet won't even come out. He sends a messenger out. So this would have been a humbling act also. So Elisha was showing no respect for the person of Naaman. It was also, there was also no respect shown for the efforts he made to come. I've already mentioned some of that. Just coming to the king of Israel, bringing this, this load of bounty along, bringing his servants. It was a great journey. And yet there was no, of course, we're kind of mirroring this, right? To today with Christians making great efforts, you know, for the Lord and everything. But Elisha is being like, like the Lord and he is not showing any consideration for the efforts. You're going to see in this, you're going to see the grace and mercy of God. You are not going to be seeing God's commending the efforts of anyone. And that's really, I mean, that's really what this is all about. Because Naaman was a strong man, but he needed to be healed. But God wanted him to know that he, that is God, was the one doing the healing. And it was of nothing that anyone else had done. And so again, there was no respect shown for the tremendous effort that Naaman and his group had, had made. There was no respect shown for the material rewards offered. The reward listed here says they had 10 talents of silver. I believe a talent is 100 pounds. So that would be like 1,000 pounds of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. So this was a very good and generous amount. But here again, there was no respect shown for the reward. You know, you know how it is today. Well, what do you have to give me? Huh? What do you have to give me? How are the churches today in, the, in this age of the prosperity gospel? But there was no consideration given for this either. I mean, Naaman came to do business, and yet the material rewards were of no concern to Elisha. Then there was also no respect shown for Naaman's values uh, regarding the water. Now, remember, Elisha sent a servant out to meet Naaman. And what did he tell him? He said, go down and wash in the Jordan River seven times and you will be clean. Now, Naaman was angry. He was angry at this because he considered the waters in, in Assyria far, far better than the Jordan River. And of course, he washed all the time. Now, what he said may have been true, like by earthly standards, perhaps those waters were better, but... What good does it do to go down to the Jordan and wash? And not only that, this is not what he expected from Elisha. Just look at what he said here after he was told to go down and wash. It says, Naaman was wroth. He was angry. He went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike the hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. Naaman wanted Elisha to put on a show. Think of those such as, dare I say, Benny Hinn. Think of those that are just going and putting on shows today. And we get a lot of that around here. We see a lot of advertisements for people who are, who are saying they will put on a show with their miracles. They will do this. They will do that. Elisha didn't do any of these things. He stayed put in the house. He said, go wash in the river. Do you know what this was? This was an act of faith. It was an obedient act of faith and a humbling act for Naaman to go and do this. And so for Elisha to come out and make a big to-do over this would have been honoring, you see, to Naaman. It was honoring either for the level of the disease or it was honoring for Naaman's person to come out and show him this respect. And it also would have distracted a little because it would have brought attention to Elisha and not God. And Elisha wasn't going to do that. And so we look 
But after this, when Naaman had turned away, his servants came to him and said, Master, you know, actually he said, my father, I'm sorry. If the prophet had bid you to come and do some great thing, wouldn't you have done that? Wouldn't it have sounded better if he had said, well, I want you and your group to go and circle Mount Zion for seven days and, and then fast for a few days and, and do this or do that? No. All you have to do is go wash. You know why? That's our God. He is powerful and he is not limited. And so that made sense to Naaman. They said, well, I might as well do it. He took that act of faith. He probably didn't believe much in it, but he did it. He obeyed. And that's important. Obedience is faith. Even if we say, boy, I don't see what's going to happen, it is faith. And so he came again, and his flesh was whole. And this time, when he came back, Elisha met with him. And what happened? What happened? What happened is Naaman was converted. Naaman was converted. What does he say? He says that, he said, your servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. You see, God had proven himself. He had humbled Naaman. He had taken away every, every piece of interaction that men could have. And so, and so he knew that it was the God of Israel that was working powerfully. And uh, if you know this story, it is a wonderful story. There's more to it than this. Uh, I should say there's a little interaction with Gehazi later on because Gehazi wanted the reward. You think of how great this is of Elisha. He's not going to take a reward either because then it also might look like, hey, you can buy the gift of God for money, right? And Elisha knew he hadn't done anything. I mean, he had interceded in a way, but he did nothing but allow God to work. And he pointed to the God of heaven. Now, for us today, this means something. God may well humble us on the way to answering our prayers. He wants us to trust in him. He wants us to know that his power is not limited. And so I have another scripture to share, which is perfectly in keeping with this. I think this was a, a great description for what happened, because like I say, Naaman was humbled. All the things that he thought were of value, even his own person, you see, he had to be brought low. He had to agree with the water. He had to listen to the girl. You know, all of his efforts were just kind of disregarded. He's not used to that. He's the captain of the host. The whole army does what he says, right? 1 Corinthians one twenty seven says, God has chosen the foolish things of, this, of the world to confound the wise. And has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and things that are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. When God does these things, it is for our good. It is for the increase of our faith. It does bring him glory, but it is for the increase of our faith. And I hope we can take a lesson from Naaman the Syrian. And just kind of follow God at every step. Because each step was a little more humbling, but in the end, God was still faithful and merciful. I just said, it's done. You're healed. I hope that this has been a benefit for you. May you have a good day in the Lord.